All right, there we go. Let's get our Facebook groups in here before we start our show. Spinning wheels going, still going, one and uh, two. All right, welcome in, welcome in. It's Tuesday night, the 16th of April. It's time for an episode of Building the Broncos. I am Nick Kendall, joined by Carl Dummler. Carl, how you doing? What's new? What's good? Uh, we got some news to talk about today. Yeah, yeah, no, things are good here. Finally getting to that spring weather. Uh, had a 90 degree weather the other day. So I got to go run outside for the first time in a long time. And my son thought it was hilarious to go outside and watch me run. So I'm out there sweating like crazy. He's under a shade tree drinking a root beer. And every time I ran by, he'd take a little sip and just give me a little wave. And so, yeah, no, but it is. It feels good to get outside, getting a little bit more of a tan, getting some color again. There you that go. That feels good. And uh, and always that means then, of course, NFL draft coming up here mm-hmm. nine days. And uh, then we'll be seeing who, what the Broncos are going to be doing. That's exciting. Yeah, all the hypotheticals go away, but we're going to, you know, we still got nine days left of hypotheticals. So a lot of fun to talk about still. I know a lot of people, including myself, are ready for the results, but, you know, we'll uh, we'll keep digging uh, until we get there. But uh, let's say hello to people coming in the chat. We got Riptide uh, kicking us off with a super chat here. Five dollar super chat says Denver should do nothing. Uh, he's talking about Cortland Sutton here. He says Denver should do nothing. If he wants to hold out fine, don't trade him and don't pay him. He's financially spoiled. I don't want him. I do want him on the field, though. Yeah, I don't think this is a situation where I hold anybody at any fault at all. Cortland Sutton's going to be right now. I think his contract is the 21st highest paid. If you go annual allotted value, that AAV acronym for those at home uh, comes out at 21st. I think he's right behind Judy at 20th and he, you have two years left of control for him. I think he's somewhere like a high end wide receiver too at the X spot. I understand he wants more guaranteed money, but unless somebody's coming and offering a decent, you know, price for him, which why would they in this uh, upcoming draft? Uh, I probably just hold on to him and say, man, that's, that's the deal. I don't know. It's the contract. <laughs> yeah. And so just for everybody to catch up what's going on, Broncos started their voluntary camp today and Cortland Sutton was a no show for that camp. This happens. Justin Jefferson didn't show up for the Vikings one as well. There's usually about, I'd say, 10 players every year that seem to kind of fall into this category of not showing up for voluntary camps What for, for a variety of reasons. You know, some of them, they have their own training regime. Um, I'm going to throw a name out here that everybody's going to hate. Melvin Gordon. He, he skipped almost every single voluntary camp that he could. Uh, he said, I, I just like the people that I work out with. I get healthier. That's just what I like to do. And so I, I don't find this to be too big of a deal. It's one of the few plays that a player can do to show a team, hey, I'm serious about this. I want this new contract. I don't blame him for wanting more guarantees when you've only got two more two million more guarantees left in your contract. Like if he gets hurt this year, like really bad injury, this could be it for him contract wise. So this is his one last chance to really put that big power play out there unless he just goes out there and has an incredible season. So um, again, I don't blame him for what he's doing, but I also don't blame the Broncos if they say, yeah, we're sticking with what we got. Deal with it or sit out, whatever you want to do, but this is what it is. Yeah, and the specifics are he's on the books this year for $13 million, uh, but he has a two only $2 million of that's guaranteed, and he has a fully non-guaranteed base of $13.5 million in 2025. Uh, the Broncos can save, I believe it is about, let me see, I have the data right here, about $19 uh, million from moving, no, not 19, gosh, excuse me, 9.7 if they trade him and 7.7 if they release him. Uh, so can get a little bit more incentivized to get a l- two extra million dollars by trading him rather than releasing him. But again, I think he is a productive wide receiver and he is, was I think not even debatable Denver's best skill position player last year. And somebody who was productive in an offense that struggled with timing in the past game. And really, I mean, just, there's not a lot of layups for Cortland Sutton. You see a lot of these wide receivers are peppered with layups, you know, the easy targets and, Two years ago, I remember there's arguing on, I can't remember what game it was, but like Cortland Sutton having to leave his feet on a slant route because the quarterback struggling to hit him on time in a way that, you know, can lead to yak or stuff. I mean, just hard. I mean, there's some drops on tape, of course, too, but he's a productive wide receiver. And I don't think that I'm just looking to get rid of him to get rid of him. Yeah, no, like I said, 
especially if you were going to go bring in a new rookie quarterback to possibly start, you want to have players that can go make plays for that quarterback. That, that quarterback could trust them. That's a big thing really early in, a, in somebody's career is can they trust the person they're going to throw it to to actually go catch this or fight for it for those 50-50 balls especially. Because you have to make some of those in the NFL to make it as a quarterback. And, you know, Peyton Manning, he knew who he could throw it to in those moments. Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, you know, all those guys, they have their players that they can trust. And right now, I would say Cortland Sutton's probably your most trustworthy receiver to actually go make those kind of plays. Like I said, making those tough catches, 10 touchdowns this last year. I mean, that's nothing to, to sneeze at. That's a highly productive receiver there. Um, I don't think he's ever going to be a top 10 wide receiver, even if you get him a great quarterback. But he can still – he could go put up a 1,000-yard season for you and another 10-touchdown kind of season. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really hope that he gets to stay with the Broncos this year and maybe even next year because it is a really pretty – pretty, I'd say standard contract. Like it, it fits well with where he is as a player. It's one of those that I feel like both sides actually are getting what you would expect. He's not getting overpaid like Jerry Judy, but he's also not so underpaid that you're going, oh, yeah, I understand why you're sitting out because you should be getting the next big contract like Justin Jefferson. Yeah, without a doubt. And you make a really salient point about rookie quarterback, too. But first, let's say hello to more people in the chat. We got Don in here uh, coming in saying painful as it sounds. Time to move on and up. We got David Youngkin coming in here. Evening, everyone. I heard he wants more money, but he still has a year or two left on his contract. I might be wrong. I think it's more about the guarantees, as you mentioned earlier, Carl. Uh, of course, he wants more money. This he's going to be twenty nine, I believe, October tenth. I looked up his birthday earlier, uh, and then thirty on the last year of his deal there. So uh, that's you know approaching the cliff for wide receiver. So. Definitely looking to cash in maybe one more time. Maybe it's in Denver, maybe it's elsewhere, but the guarantee, I think, is the the main point there. Mike S. comes in and says, what's, what's up, Carl, Nick, Scott, Dylan, and Broncos country. Corey Johnson says, uh, Chris Braswell, Edge seems underrated. I honestly thought he'd test better than he did, uh, than he actually did, which was a little bit of a disappointing a disappointment for me. He tested fine. Uh, he's going to be a day-two option. Edge rusher t tends to fall off a cliff uh, after the first round. You can still find some guys there, but a lot of times the real difference makers, you need to take them round one uh, if you're going to swing at them. But Chris Braswell stands out there. Um, Isaac, uh, the Penn State edge rusher, that's not Chob Robinson. Um, I keep Adiasa, something like that. Uh, yeah. It sticks out to me. And uh, Neyland, uh, who might end up sneaking into the first round based on what a lot of people have been saying, edge rusher from uh, Western Kentucky. So Bris Braswell's in that tier after the top four guys in this class. Well, I want to talk about what is underrated, and that is AG1. The older I get, the more seriously I know I have to take care of my health and nutrition. And that's where AG1 enters into. No matter what you do for a living, it can become all too convenient to rely on coffee and caffeine for that extra energy and focus. But that's not great for your body, especially blood pressure. And there's always that dreaded crash. With AG1, I get sustained energy, so I'm not reaching for another cup of coffee in the afternoon. On top of that, I can't stand swallowing those massive multivitamins. And we all know how crucially important it is to take care of your gut health when it comes to probiotics. AG1 checks all three of those boxes, and it does so in an impressive, life-altering way. Focus, energy, nutrition, and improved gut health. All in one delicious smoothie. AG1 is next-level stuff. AG1 is a supplement I trust to support my whole body health and help me feel my very best. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs when you first subscribe. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash huddle. Again, that's drinkag1.com forward slash huddle. Check it out today. So keep circling it back here. Let's say hello to more people in the chat. Michael Davis in here agreed Sutton's old regime antics need to go. He wants more than 2 million guaranteed in 2024. Is he playing? Is his playing deserving of it? Perhaps his attitude? Definitely not. I don't know if I take Sutton as a malcontent. I haven't really heard very much of that. I guess him not showing up for OTAs might, you know, lean into that. But I literally the only time I can think of him being reportedly a problem was there was a fight between Emmanuel Sanders and him a couple of years ago and that was in training camp, but you can, you can correct me if I'm and, wrong, but. So I, I was there and Sanders was more the problem there than Sutton. 
Sanders we was too much about that, but yes. <laughs> yeah. But it, it was one of those practices where um, energy was pretty low and Sanders mm-hmm. was walking everywhere and Sutton, I think it was maybe his second year in the league, third year in the league, something like that. And he just went over to Sanders and said, dude, like you're the veteran here. Like show us what we're supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. Sanders took offense to that, grabbed his helmet, took a swing there at Sutton. And then they got into a little scuffle and so that was more, I think, Sutton showing good leadership of trying to get another teammate motivated to actually lead others. Um, and then that was the year that Sanders ended up getting traded halfway through the year because he quit on the team. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think Sutton's that big of a problem locker room wise. I've always heard pretty darn good things about his work ethic. Um, I think this offseason we've seen a little bit more of a malcontent process for him. Jerry Judy getting mm-hmm. traded. Um, some other teammates, Simmons, you know, each of those players gone, we've seen him put something on social media of not being happy about it. And I I don't get too upset about that. Like these are teammates. These are guys you've been around for the last five, six years and you know, their family, you know, their kids. So I understand like that's painful when you leave a good friend or they have to leave because your team's not keeping them. I, I don't blame a player for putting something out there saying, Hey, I'm going to miss this guy. I think this is a bad mistake. Yeah. Yeah. I am with you on that. We got Troy Brewer coming in here saying, Hey guys, how much are our draft views affected by anchoring effect of our team's draft position? Have a great show. Is it okay? I'm going to be stupid here. Anchoring effect. It's because where we're at at 12, like would we have a different position uh, disposition if we had the first overall pick? Yeah. I would have a, I'd have a different outlook on the team if we had guaranteed Caleb Williams coming in uh, next season. And I probably would have gone about the offseason a little differently. Uh, and 12 is a the Broncos going to have a chance to move if they want, but it's going to be costly and they're just not dealing from a position <clears throat> of sur- they don't have a surplus of assets to really move around the board. So I believe that's what well, he means by that. And, and I would say this especially ties into a couple of the quarterbacks like mm-hmm. a Bo Nix or a Michael Penix would that change your view of them? Let's say the Broncos had the first overall pick. Would you still be viewing them as that player? Like, Oh, take him at 12. He's going to be a great player for you. Or would you be sitting there saying, no, he's probably more of a second, third round kind of guy. Maybe not going to be your long-term starter. Um, You know, I think sometimes you start talking yourself into some of these guys that are going to be in your range. Like, Oh yeah, this guy, he could be that next big star for you Mm -hmm. just because that's who's going to be available. And and it's hard when it's not looking like the Broncos are going to be the team to trade up. Now, yeah. I, I could be completely wrong. Sean Payton does Sean Never Payton, know. No. you know. <laughs> so maybe the Broncos do end up being that team. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but, again, I, I do think that probably does happen some where you want to try to talk yourself into a player, especially when they get connected to the Broncos, like Michael Penix and Bo Nix. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and thank you so much for the super chat, Troy. Really appreciate you coming in. I uh, wanted to get to this from DTR says, uh, talking about the Cortland Sutton contracts and just the Denver Broncos financial situation. Said Sertan will be looking for a new contract coming up soon too. So Denver has some decisions to make. They do have some decisions to make. What I will say is that this is a team that does not have many people on the books beyond 2025. So you get through this year, you get through next year, and then it's you literally only have 10 players under contract. Now you have the draft class coming in too, which will add to that. But uh, the only players on this roster that you have under contract for 2026 are McGlinchey, Powers, Brandon Jones, and your draft class from last year, plus Sawazarike because of his uh, gambling thing. He gets an <laughs> extra year, an extra year uh, yeah. for the Broncos there. So you have, let's see what the number is here for the Broncos salary cap wise um, in uh, 2026. They should have, uh, 308 million to spend if they want. So, um, yeah, Denver is going to have plenty of options as far as structuring these contracts. If they want to keep Sertan, it's not going to be a problem at all. Miners as well in that conversation, not that DTR saying it is a conversation. They do have tough decisions regardless because it is a zero sum when it comes to the salary cap. Uh, but yeah, yeah the, the way the roster is set up right now, you could really turn over the entirety of the team in another two years. Well, and that's most NFL rosters are overturned about 75% every few years anyway. Just cost of players, draft picks, obviously gone. Most NFL careers only last 
somewhere between two to three years anyway. Um, so th- that's just kind of expected. I, I saw a Bengals writer saying the Broncos are in, are in cap hell right now. And so they have to trade Sertan because they can't pay him. I'm going, what, what are you doing? No, <laughs> this is stupid. Even if they didn't have a whole lot of cap space next year, like you can still work that contract where he doesn't have that big cap hit next year right off the bat. You could have him only making six million against the cap next season. Yeah. It's not that crazy. But we got Michael Ronquillo coming in saying, Good evening, Nick and Carl on building the Broncos. Go Broncos. Michael, always great to see you. And thank Cody you for the w. stars, Michael. Yeah, always giving the stars, Michael. Yeah. And Cody W with the five dollar super saying lots of veterans miss OTAs. I'm more worried about Sutton and if he is going to look the same after his ankle surgery. Yeah, I, I'm not too worried about it. I mean, it was kind of a minor thing from what I understand. Um, he's another year removed from his ACL tear. He looked fine moving last year. Like you said, I said, I think the, the bigger thing is what are we going to see this year compared to last year and how they try to use him? Um, obviously, still depends on who they get at quarterback. Um, but I just want to see when you don't have Russell Wilson being your quarterback, can you get him, like you said, some of those easier throws, the quick slants, give him a chance to go get down the field for another 10 yards, um, get him seven to eight catches a game instead of two to three. Mm-hmm. And so I, I want to see how that looks for him, where you can get him more involved in the game on a consistent basis. Yeah, I'm with Cody again. A lot of veterans miss OTAs. We'll see how it plays out. I do think that Broncos have been motivated or like at least listening intently on offers for uh, Sutton the last heck it's been probably 14 months now, um, 14, 15 months, but they haven't gotten exactly what they wanted. And I feel like if they were so desperate to trade him or move on from him, it would have already happened, right? Like they, they had that 2 million became guaranteed I think it was somewhere around the start of the league year uh, that right. then, you know, was only 2 million more, but like, if you're like, Oh, we're going to dump him, which seems to be some of the conversation here besides just outright trading him. And you're not worried about the return on it. And it's about the money that you get back. Why wouldn't you have done it earlier before those guarantees even kicked in? I mean, if, if it's about pinch, uh, pinching pennies, there's 2 million right there. Maybe you're holding out hope, but I hope it's not, I hope it's not another case of Denver, holding on to assets too long and then the market depreciates and they're like left with their, you know what in their hand, which has been too often the case uh, for this regime of late. They did not do that with Von Miller. They did not do that with Bradley Chubb, but uh, Jerry Judy specifically, uh, Justin Simmons. I mean, you kind of look back, it's like, man, if this is where we're at now, they should have made the move much earlier. Yeah, it is unfortunate with some of those. I get, you know, they had that five game winning streak for that middle part and that just really put him in a tough spot of do we really try to go and win this get to the playoffs or do we see that our team got some lucky breaks during that five games um talking and and this is not a lucky break this has come from patrick saying aloha btb watching live which is great to see still awake i saw a mock mock where we go up to three for Jaden daniels of lsu well i mean I can tell you if Sean Payton had complete control, nobody else had any kind of say, I would fully believe there's a really good chance the Broncos get into the top four just because he, he wants to do that. That's just, that's who he is. And he wants his quarterback. He's going to go get his quarterback. I'm not hundred percent sure if it'd be Jaden Daniels is the guy that he wants though. I, I just think there's parts of his games that don't line up with what Payton really likes to do on offense. Now he can, he can redesign an offense to work with any quarterback. So I'm the, the two of them could make it work. I'm just saying there's other guys like I think Drake May would be a much better fit with Peyton, just what he really can push and how he wants to attack the middle of the field. That is Drake May. Yeah, I do. And I have enjoyed uh, Nate Tice's um, recent comparison for Jaden Daniels, which in terms of arm talent and fitting the ball into windows and et cetera, uh, as a fast Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, what's so weird about Jaden Daniels is that he's pretty much, if he's not playing in the pocket and delivering the ball, it's a scramble. The The ball's outside of the pocket. Like, he doesn't run to throw. He breaks pocket and then runs to run, which, I mean, hard to argue the results at the SEC level, but how translatable is that to the NFL? I mean, who 
plays the game like Jaden Daniels. Now, obvious, you know, asterisks to this. Who played the game like Lamar Jackson before Lamar Jackson? He's not Lamar Jackson. Uh, but I don't know. I just have, at 12 overall, I'd be fine with Jaden Daniels. But at this conversation about him being, no doubt, top three pick, uh, I don't quite understand. He's a first-round player, I, but a blue-chip, top-of-the-draft, no-doubt guy? I, I don't know about that. I will say, if all that it takes is the trade that they have out there, which is the first pick, their 12th pick in 76, and next year's first to get up to three, I'd do that in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. Like that, that, That's not happening. <laughs> it's taken three first-round picks and more. If the Broncos want to get up that high, I'm sorry. That, that's just that that's the starting point for that conversation. I think you're probably right, but Hey, maybe they don't like these quarterbacks at the top after Caleb Williams, as much as we are led to believe. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. I still really like Drake may, but there's some of the accuracy numbers are concerning uh, for him overall. Now, granted he's younger than everybody else uh, than, than JJ McCarthy. And he was put on either the first or the second worst situation of the top quarterbacks in this draft class is either him or Caleb Williams. Um, as crazy as it is to say about USC, I mean, they were just God awful around him uh, this season, especially in the trenches. Uh, but got Adam strange coming in and says, what's up Broncos maniacs. Good to see you, Adam. Larry O'Neill says, just started watching and listening to you guys. Great podcast. Oh, well, thank you so much, Larry. We appreciate that. James comes in and says, Bo Nix. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad Bo Nix, but uh, we'll see it. I mean, pretty volatile. Um, uh, the opinions there in Broncos country. We'll see what happens. Phil McLaughlin says, good evening, Nick and Carl and Deacon Scott. What did we pay for Blackson? Can we restructure Sutton and free up cap space? Buckham, MHH for life, uh, Broncos for life. There probably is a way to restructure Sutton's contract where you lower his base this season and add years, but he's going to be 30 at the end of this contract. Uh, do you really want to do that to add more years onto him? I mean, I doubt there's a situation out there, Carl, where you lower his cap hit this year, but raise the overall guarantees to keep him. I mean, sometimes you see that with some guys, but I can't imagine him outright giving up money without new years on the back end and making more accumulatively. But um, I guess there's, I guess I've, we've seen that before as far as Blackson. I don't know the exact numbers, but at this point in free agency, it was not a lot uh, for him. I'm guessing he's somebody who's going to compete for a roster spot. I would say until we see him on the field, preseason uh he is very much a will he or won't he make the roster kind of addition yeah i think last year he only made like a million dollars only yeah i well okay for nfl terms yeah for us we'd be like oh my gosh a million dollars um but yeah for him it's i'm guessing it's somewhere around that between one to two million dollars it's not very much Uh, i wouldn't even i would bet maybe half a million of it is guaranteed so it isn't that big of a deal if he doesn't make the roster that's probably i mean he's just a he's a back end of the of the 53 man roster at this point Mm -hmm. that you you hope other guys step up and you don't have to have him on the roster but he's a nice veteran to have there if other guys don't step up Mm -hmm. yeah i am with you on that we got a draft question coming in saying i'm the man says is lot two better than verse choose kindness and choose compassion I think that they are very close and really it's going to come down to what you're looking for. I think versus they both have, it's really, we had this long conversation last week, Carl, they both have Mm -hmm. high floors in different ways. Latu is such a high floor because he's so skilled as a pass rusher. He just has so many moves in his bag. Uh, I think I use this comparison with Scott, but it's like Greg Maddox. We're like, he doesn't have anything that's like an a plus overpowering you, but he can, you know, very accurate and like, you know, eight different pitches and different, different speeds and everything. That's kind of like Latu where, you know, you don't know what's coming as a pass protector because he has so many moves, uh, but he's not as explosive or power compact as a Jared verse where, you know, he's going to bring that power element to the field first down, second down. He's going to bring you pass rushing while still being a plus player as an edge setter in the run game uh, where Latu doesn't really bring that as much. Uh, both of them are a little bit older, uh, Verse doesn't have the injury concerns that Latu does. So I guess from where I'm sitting, just being a little bit more conservative, I'd lean verse just slightly because of the medical history stuff. Uh, but I think either of my answer to this is which one would I rather have? I'd rather trade back and take the last one standing, whichever one I can spend the least value on is the one I want. Cause I view them that closely. Yeah. I, I'm with you there. I mean, I, I probably favor Latu over verse 
and you're the, you're the reverse of that. Um, just because I love that technician, I love I love his ability to get after the quarterback a little bit more, and so I, I would definitely take him first. But either one of them, I'd be very happy to add to the Broncos. That they day one be the best pass rusher on the on the roster. You know, Barrett Brown, Baron Browning, maybe right off the bat early on could be a little bit better, but it won't take too long before they're one of the top guys. And, and you've already said it on here a couple times. Um, if you want elite pass rushers, you got to get them in the first. The, the chances of getting them after that top 15, top 20 pick, pretty slim. So it's, it's got to be one of those probably there's about three guys that I would really bank on to say, Hey, these are going to be good NFL players at the edge position. Then there's a couple other guys that maybe could come into that kind of place. Like a Neeland, you don't know exactly how he's going to fare in the NFL. Um, Chop Robinson's another one, but beyond that, the rest of them look more like complementary pieces that you add to a roster. Yeah. I really think there's an argument that uh, Byron Murphy is the best pass rusher in the uh, draft class. Um, but yeah. we'll see what happens where he goes, um, in the draft, really talented, uh, really, really talented and young pass rusher, interior defensive lineman from Texas, uh, Gary Palmer coming in here, keeping the lights on, keeping Nick, uh, flush with baby diapers. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, not for me, um, for, for my little guy. Uh, although I mean, <laughs> draft coverage, you never know. It says, hi, Nick and Carl. I like Sutton, but if he's unhappy, it might be better if we trade him. <sighs> I agree to an extent, but again, I always feel like he's come off. And from what I've heard, he's been well-spoken and a professional and put in the work. Uh, so maybe things have changed now. You know, the fact that he's heard his name in the trade rumors over and over again, maybe he doesn't feel as valued. Maybe like Wilson and, you know, things are falling apart there. I don't know. Uh, but as far as trading him, if he's unhappy, I'm not just looking to give him away to give him away. Um, I would be looking for at least a top 125 pick for him uh hopefully a, d a day two pick in the end maybe it's something where you're f sending a six and Sutton to get back a three are you going to get that before the draft probably not uh, heck probably your best chance to trade him would be day three of the draft uh this season or day two of the draft where teams are sitting there like okay we really love the wide receivers this draft we're planning on taking one day two uh oh didn't work out that way um guy we wanted was there somebody we loved we couldn't pass up is there but we still need a wide receiver enter Cortland Sutton. Uh, so those are the ones that I think make sense for me. I could also see a team that has a rookie, uh, a rookie quarterback, a rookie contract quarterback, excuse me, looking to bring in Sutton just to help, help the room a little bit. You know, somebody like the Panthers giving up a 2025 draft pick just to get an adult in the room there in the pass catching spot, or a team doesn't have a rookie co quarterback contract, but devoid of quarterback or a wide receiver talent right now, like the bills. I mean, the bills would probably love uh, to have Cortland Sutton out there. So there's going to be uh, people out for him. I'm not just going to give him up to give him up though. Yeah. And, and like I said, I, I don't know that any of this points to him being unhappy. I, I think this is just, like I said, players have very few things that they can do to help in their contract negotiations, mm -hmm. sitting out voluntary practices. Sometimes that makes teams go, Oh yeah, let's, let's revisit this. Let's talk to them. Um, I know this is stupid, but this happens all the time. Uh, unfollowing the team page on Instagram or Twitter or any of those kind of things and wiping your, your social media of any pictures of them that you possibly can, you know, players do that all the time. It doesn't mean that they hate the team or they won out or anything like that. Like I said, it's just a contract negotiation tactic that they use. It's not a very good one, but they don't have very many options anyway. So I, I still think there's a very good chance Cortland Sutton's in Denver. I think he's happy to be here. Yeah. Well, that, I don't know if I said hello to Zach powers earlier, but always bringing in good points to the, uh, the chat. Good to see you, Zach. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I know that. Uh, so talking about wide receivers here, Carl, let's say the Broncos do end up trading Cortland Sutton. How does the room stack out for you uh, for the Broncos, how they currently stand? Obviously they brought in Josh Reynolds for pretty darn cheap overall, but you know, paid him enough that he's, viable somebody on the roster this season uh mims they moved judy and sean payton during the combine press conference mentioned about well we would have gotten more reps for him but you know him and judy kind of play the same spot uh same type of wide receiver role so they moved him so mims is very much part of the rotation uh but without sutton i mean i look at the weapons on this team and like 
who does much of anything uh, on this team that makes you excited at all? I mean, essentially, you're going to have very, very, very specific roles for each of these wide receivers. You know, the, the one nice thing with Sutton is he's kind of got a nice all around game. He can do the quick slants if you need him to. Uh, I know they didn't use it last year, but that's just because Russell Wilson can't throw that pass on a regular basis. Like he cannot consistently work on the timing and be accurate and, and do that. Well, Um, he can win over the top. He can win with his route running. He can win with power. He can win with jumping over the top. Um, That's the nice thing that he brings to the table is you just don't know exactly how the Broncos are going to use him from a play to play basis. Tim Patrick, he's a very, he's very limited. What, What he's good at. He's really good at his ability to run the, the nine route, the fly route, whatever you want to call it, the go route. Um, he can get down the field. He's big. He's strong. He's fast. Uh, I hope he's still fast. Um, we'll have to see after these last two injuries. He can do that. And he can do the comeback routes. He's very good at those. Those are his two, two main things that he can do on the field. Mims, we saw the Broncos like to use him in those gadget plays. He can still do those kind of things. You hope that he can add a couple more things to his game this year compared to last year that especially now that Jerry Judy's gone, you can put him in some of those kind of roles and, and maybe you have a quarterback that can actually take advantage of those kind of wide receivers compared to again, Russell Wilson. Um, so, and Josh Reynolds, he's probably the more all around guy for you. He's not to Sutton's level by any means, not even close, but I guess he'd probably take over for Cortland Sutton in that spot. And then you kind of hope that you can just hold it together until you can next year get into that first round pick. And and this is where as much as I'd love to see the Broncos trade up, like if you have to give up three first round picks to go get your guy, you've already put that quarterback in a tough spot where they don't have the weapons around them to actually succeed. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can still do okay, but you really like to give them something to depend on. Um, you know, obviously Patrick Mahomes had Tyree kill Travis Kelsey. Um, the bills went out and got, um, Diggs. a couple different wide receivers for him Diggs, Yeah. I know he's not there anymore, but you wouldn't got him a true number one wide receiver to, to have with him. Um, you look there in with the 49ers and Brock Purdy, like they had some great weapons for him to step in there and be successful day one. That, that's what you want to see. And Broncos don't have that. Even with Sutton, they don't have that. But they really don't have it when Sutton's out of that building. Yeah, I mean, I th- I think I can pretty confidently say that if you take Sutton out of the equation in terms of the Broncos' skill positions in running back, tight end, and wide receiver, it's a bottom three room in the league. And it's probably bottom s- seven, ten right now. Uh, but is, you know... Brandon Johnson, Tim Patrick, Josh Reynolds, Marvin Mims, little Jordan Humphrey, Adam Troutman, Greg Dulcich, Javonta Williams, Samaj P. Ryan doing anything. I mean, it, are those guys going to be even drafted in fantasy football beyond, you know, like <laughs> 16 team leagues? I just uh, right. it's a uh, it's a bad looking group. Now, that obviously can reset. As we've talked about on here, it's a deep wide receiver class in the draft. Uh, some people say it's been probably one of the better classes in a decade. But I also see the comments in here about wide receivers being a dime a dozen there's wide receivers coming in the draft every year, but you look at the market and what these guys get paid. They're not a dime a dozen. Uh, the difference makers teams want three or four wide receivers that they like and they can trust. And when, what I mean, Scott can probably answer this in the chat or something, but like Darnell Mooney, who's been injured and kind of a gadget guy on the bears. And he goes out there and gets 13 million a year, 14 million a year out there for Atlanta to be the third or fourth weapon. I mean, I know they're coming in every year and there's a lot of wide receivers, but look at what the market is saying. These guys are valuable. They are sought after the um, value on the market is not always dictated by scarcity, but also by impact and wide receiver value is definitely dictated by impact. So I don't, I don't agree that it is a dime a dozen. You have a chance to replenish the position, but there's no guarantees. No team has spent more. uh, I think I read a last five drafts. Denver is one of the top five teams in spending draft picks, top 100 draft picks on wide receivers. Jerry Judy, Marvin Mims, 
KJ Hamler, probably even another one in there too. I'm missing, but like you haven't gotten that right. You have not hit. So there are guys available, but there's no guarantees. And again, the market says these guys are super valuable, even though there are new ones coming to the league every year. Yeah. I, I mean, if they were a dime a dozen, Jerry Judy would have been something for the Broncos. He wasn't. Mm -hmm. And, and he still got paid. <laughs> That's what's kind of crazy. Um, now the Browns, that was a ridiculous contract to hand to that guy. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's still, you, if you don't have wide receivers to throw to, it, it becomes a problem. You know, when, when teams can dedicate more to the front seven and stopping the run and like daring you to throw the football because they know nobody can get open and that becomes a huge problem. Yeah. So, uh, becomes a very limited offense at that point. And, uh, yeah, we've got, yeah, Sutton and 18, Carlos Henderson. Oh my gosh. Dummy. That. <laughs> I, man, that one, I, I loved Carlos Henderson in the draft. I really thought he was going to be something. And if he, I think if he had a head on his shoulders, the, the talent was there, like athletically speaking, that guy was set up to be a huge player in the NFL, but just couldn't get his head right. So, um, that, that's a, that's a tough one. Plus, um, now I have a real grievance with him because, he tried to rip me off for like 500 bucks once. Wow. Well, that's uh yeah. Yeah. Now I don't, I guess I shouldn't say, I don't know if it was him. It was his Twitter account. He was uh, giving away or selling some Xboxes. And I don't know. I thought about trying to buy one and found out. Thankfully I found out before I gave money. Well, good. That this was not going to be good. So yeah, Carlos Henderson, you and I have beef. The New Mexico man saying entitled, entitled, spoiled Sutton do nothing. He is worth more to the Broncos. If he's traded, uh, I, I don't know if I believe in that, but Hey man, New Mexico man, you're definitely entitled to that opinion. And, uh, I mean, fourth in the NFL and touchdowns last season, a lot of just, I think he had two of the top five, most improbable catches last year as well. Is he a number one that you love? No, but I think he's a viable number two at an X. If you can match him with a Z slash slot, that can be a, a higher volume player. But I mean, we'll see. Kind of like also you said, Jerry Judy overpaid, maybe, uh, but maybe it goes to a team that has better on time quarterback play. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's the Judy. I mean, that's the Browns obviously thought so giving him that contract. So we will see on that one. I, I don't know with Judy. We'll see. Um, we have a uh, Doug Tessier come in and says, Adam Brenneman thinks Nix is going to be the second best quarterback in the draft. I don't know who Adam Brenneman is, but possible. I mean, Nix is a good frame and protects the football pretty well. And a lot of starts to his game. So uh, I think there's a chance he could be the second best one. And also it's possible that he's the second best one in a way that, uh, gosh, <laughs> Justin Fields is the second best one from that 2021 class because really Trevor Lawrence was the only hit, right? All these other guys hyped up and, uh, you know, Zach Wilson, uh, Mac Jones, uh, who's the last one? Trey Lance, not really hit. So, I mean, that could be the case of the other guys not hitting Greg Smith in the yeah, house. So good he, to see you. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say he, uh, does some spots for the big 10 network he used to play for Penn state and UMass. If you remember, he was a tight end, I think. Um, oh, wow. And so now he does college football analytics and some of those kind of things. So just another sports figure, sports media guy out there. And I mean, all, all these quarterbacks have their, their fans and people that are against them for many different reasons. Um, you know, we talked about Drake may earlier. There's some that look at him and say, okay, he has some really dumb decisions. He has some bad accuracy plays. If you only look at his tape from this last year, you're kind of going, mm, there's some things missing there. Of course, you got to ask that question of why. Why were why were things missing this last year that weren't missing the year before? Um, Caleb Williams has his detractors of people pointing and saying, hey, this is why he's going to fail in the NFL. So um, it doesn't surprise me that somebody likes Knicks. I like Knicks. I, I've talked about that on the show before. Um, not at 12. But I still like him. I still think he's a, a pretty darn good fit to to run Peyton's offense and um, do fine with it. I don't think he'll ever be a top five quarterback by any means. I'm not even sure if he'd be a top 10 quarterback. In my, I don't know. I mean, so many things can happen. Brock Purdy. Would anybody have said, hey, this is going to be a top 10 quarterback in the NFL someday? Probably not. 
when he was drafted? I still might not say that. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's true. I mean, he did. He went to the perfect system, the perfect situation. And if if Bo Nix, like let's say Bo Nix went to Minnesota. I think that's a great situation right now, especially if they bring back Justin Jefferson. I, I think he could be highly productive on that team. Mm-hmm. So fit situation matters big time. Yep. We got Daniel Callahan W coming in here saying, what do you guys think about Jordan Travis? Jordan Travis quarterback broke his ankle. I believe Florida state. Yep. Uh, he's one that I think he's wired the way you want. I don't know if he has the arm talent or the ability to put the ball in uh, tough spots that you're looking for, for an NFL starting quarterback. But for somebody that, you know, you use a, round six or seven flyer on that can at the worst case, I think be a very positive player in your quarterback room. Uh, I think that would be okay, but I don't think you're looking at him in even before the injury as uh, any sort of viable plan as a starting quarterback. Doesn't mean he won't be right again. Talk, talk about Brock Purdy again. Nobody thought that <laughs> entering that year uh, or not entering the year, but entering that draft. But that's a, um, that's probably where I think Jordan Travis is. Yeah, I, I think from what I understand, he is a very, very smart guy. Like th- there's people talking about him having a coaching career after his NFL career. And th- those are those are great people to have in the in the locker room. They're great to have in the film room, working with your starter, um, you know, helping on the sideline during games, those kind of things. But like I said, I'm not sure that I would view him as your long term solution as a starter. But uh, we got DTR coming in with a 999 super saying, Evening, Nick and Carl. If Denver moves on from Sutton, I want them to go after McCaffrey. Hashtag MHH for life. That's Luke McCaffrey from Rice at wide receiver. And <clears throat> I, I don't, yeah, I, I get it. He's fast. He's made some, some great catches in the college game. I, I still think he'd maybe be your number four or number five wide receiver for the early part of his NFL career. Um, but uh, my, my big thing there is I don't want to take players just because of the last name, just because he's a, a leg- his dad's a legend in Denver. Um, can he play or can he not play? And I do think he can play. You know, it, it was kind of, there's been some players in the past that people have really connected. I know like Rice's son is, is in the draft. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, uh, Gore. Frank Gore's Frank Gore's yeah, son. Yeah, Frank Gore's son. And people are like, oh, but he's not his his dad. Like he's not gonna be that in the NFL, in my opinion. And so you just gotta make sure you're looking at the player without looking at the name and saying, can this guy really do what some of these other guys can do? And like I said, I, I do think McGaffrey would be a good choice day three. Yeah. Somewhere day three, you're gonna have a chance at him. I mean, there's a bunch of wide receivers in that, you know kind of built. Uh, I really like Cornelius Johnson as a day three guy blocks his butt off. Maybe he's a Josh Reynolds type. I kind of fall for that. Uh, but yeah, McCaffrey round four, round five. I think that's a fine area and something the Broncos, I think they brought him in even as well. So that's uh, certainly possible, but there are a lot of viable wide receiver options for the Broncos. Uh, way, way too much talent for the amount of picks the Broncos have, right? That's, that's my biggest issue. If we need, <laughs> we need more picks. One reason for the, the trade down option here. Uh, speaking about the draft, though, talking a lot of wide receiver here and just the state of the Broncos roster. We've talked a lot about, you know, the quarterback, of course, and then it's been defensive line, edge slash interior, offensive line, and some cornerback as well. But does, if Sutton is moved or this, you know, information coming out, are you thinking that it raises the possibility that Denver takes a wide receiver in the first round? Or uh, if they trade back, maybe first round slash second round in that kind of range? And who are some guys that stand out for you? I will say, obviously, if one of the top three wide receivers falls to 12, you probably sprint into the podium. I don't think that'll happen. I do think there is a conversation to be had about Brian Thomas um, from LSU as well, just given his... Uh, what's the stat? The flying 20 was the best of the combine this season for his size. Pretty incredible basketball player. He's still kind of learning the game uh, as well. So he's, I mean, he is unbelievably gifted as an athlete. Um, like if you ask me, Carl, five years from now, if like, oh yeah, Brian Thomas came far and away the best wide receiver in that class, I'd be like, you know, the athletic profile makes sense. He's pretty raw. Yeah. I could see that. Um, yeah. You could say that about a number of the guys in this class, but Thomas is somebody who I talked about it a few shows ago. Um, Dark horse candidates for the Broncos at 12. I think Thomas is probably after this news rising up in the dark horse candidate. 
Yeah, especially if those top three guys go top nine. There's a lot of teams with that wide receiver need. Like you said, when those contracts are getting crazy, they're talking, what, $30 million for Justin Jefferson a year, mm-hmm. possibly? At least $25 yeah. million. Um, So I his value kind of goes up a little bit because of that. He is raw. He runs like two or three routes right now at the college game. And so he's still learning the the nuances of how to play the position. But if there's a guy I would take a chance on to become that true number one, Brian Thomas would be that guy. If we traded back, let's say to pick 15, 16, and he was there, I, I would have no problem with them saying, Hey, we're, we know that we're not going to be great this year. So we don't need him to be a star day one for us. Like he's going to go make some plays no matter what. Um, but year two, year three, year four, that's when we need this guy to be that that number one for us. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense for the Broncos. A um, couple other guys, um, Lad McConkey of Georgia. Again, another guy that's not going to be probably a true number one in the NFL, but he's a great route runner, makes tough catches, works hard. You can tell, like, this guy knows the little things about the game. Um, my son showed up right before we we're going to start the show today and he goes, dad, Hey, we're going to practice football today. Right. I was like, no, I got to go do my show. He's like, no, you told me we could work on the little, little things. So I could be a great football player. Like that's lad McConkey. He, he's been that guy for, for a while. Um, Ricky Purcell, uh, would be a great one in the, the second from Florida. Um, just great athletic profile makes some ridiculous catches. I, I some of the plays that he comes down with, I'm just like, what? How did that even get through the defender one? How did you have the the concentration to make that catch? That, that's him. Um, so I, I could see that one. Um, uh, Leggett of South Carolina. There's some up and down to his game. Like th- there are some freakish plays. He's again one of those freakish athletes. Big, strong. Um, Yards after catch, he can run people over, strong hands. But then there's a lot of just bad plays as well when you're watching him. Plays where he's just not in position, doesn't understand what he should be doing for leverage-wise. Um, and, and part of that, I think, is just South Carolina was just kind of a – that offense was weird, and then they they didn't always have the time to make everything work and – I, I don't know. It just looked all out of sorts most of the time, and it seemed like Leggett and and uh, um, their quarterback Rattler. had to kind of yeah, rather had to kind of just make things work, mm-hmm. and and they they kind of did it at times, but it, it just seemed really out of sync, kind of like the Broncos last year a little bit. They they were a team that like when your offensive line is that bad, you can't really do very much, right? Like you're yeah. just you can't run the football, you can't protect. Uh, it's pretty hard to evaluate everyone else when the offensive line is as bad as South Carolina's was. Uh, again, then the stat is he was under pressure 40% of his dropbacks, which is just unbelievable. Uh, you just, you don't see that. Uh, Phil McLaughlin guys, in your opinions, what's the biggest difference between Knicks and Rattler? Uh, I think Rattler is better. He's better at throwing tight windows and manipulating tough pockets and trying to hang in there and push the football. Uh, Knicks is a better athlete. He's much thicker and he protects the ball a lot better and he's not going to put you in as many bad situations. Uh, Knicks is much more of a caretaker where you're not going to go out there and, you know, go get a bucket as much where Rattler has a little bit of Baker Mayfield. I'm going to try something here uh, to his game, which I can appreciate sometimes, but it's frustrating too. The other thing is, I mean, the talent discrepancy for what Oregon had in the PAC 12 compared to what South Carolina had in the sec is, very noteworthy. Uh, very, very, right. very noteworthy. Right. But there are definitely those plays. Rattler would be coming to the sideline and a coach would go, what were you thinking? Like, what were you seeing to make that kind of decision? But then he's also going to have those throws that just leave you going, wow, okay, yep, that was that's all you. That's arm talent. That is just a natural gift that not many guys have. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I like both guys, for, like I said, for different reasons um, at different places within this draft. And Rattler, if he's grown up, I have no problem with the Broncos using a day two pick on him and just trying to see if you can get something out of him. You know, you don't have to commit to him long term. He could be a really good backup for you. Um, 
if he if he has the right attitude, I should say that. I don't know if he has the attitude to be a backup or not, but uh, but otherwise, like I said, he, maybe he could end up being a really good starter in the NFL because he does have the arm talent to do it. Yep. Yeah, uh, will be interesting. Again, it's the same thing with me with a conversation we had earlier about those edge rushers between Rattler, Penix, and Nix. Give me the last man standing. Uh, that's what I'm leaning in, and that's assuming that you know all the character stuff and everything comes out even. Uh, but going to have to start wrapping it up here, Carl. Any other names from the draft? Now that we're talking wide receiver, you mentioned McConkey, you mentioned Pearsall. Uh, does McConkey's injury history concern you at all? I mean, he missed a good chunk of games uh, in college, a lot of injuries. Um, is that a body type issue? Is that something we're going to have to worry about? A uh, back injury as well? Uh, ankle injuries? I mean, those things add up. They, they do. So yeah, th- there's definitely going to be be concerned with a lot of these guys. I mean, we talked about Latu earlier. I have very much concerns with him with that, that neck injury of what is he's going to, how long is he going to be able to last in the NFL? You know, is that going to be something that hinders him moving forward? Um, so I, any of those guys, that, that's something you got to get checked out. Why is the injury showing up? Is that just a body? T- is it a body thing? Is it just, they took some unlucky hits because I think McConkey took some bad hits in college got thrown into some bad places at times and got banged up that way. Um, but we got Riptide coming in with a $2 super saying Drew Locke had arm talent. You're right. He did. And and there's a lot of guys that come into the league. Joe Milton's going to be one. This draft has maybe top three arm talent in this draft class, but I, I don't view him as a starter in the NFL. Um, no you take those chances every once in a while. Like you, you look at the the physical gifts and you say, okay, can this guy have the mind to make it in the NFL? Josh Allen, when he came into the NFL, he was more arm talent than he was football player, quarterback. And he showed like he put in the work and he became a great NFL quarterback. You know, Patrick Mahomes, some people are kind of questioning like, Hey, can he make that, that move from the college game and what Texas tech was running to, to the NFL kind of game. Can he really do that? Or is he just a a great, great arm? Obviously he was able to make it work, but there's been plenty of other guys. Paxton Lynch is another one for the Broncos had a strong arm. Didn't have the mind for the game. So you got to find that balance between the two. Sometimes you, you take the risk more on the arm talent, the physical traits, just because some of that can translate when things break down. But there are probably more times than not where that doesn't work out in your favor. Despite all the busts at quarterback, the NFL is pretty good at evaluating the haves and have nots at quarterback. If you look at draft success over the last 10 years, not that many great day two picks uh, overall. Now we can argue, you know, separating quarterbacks one, two, and three in each class, sometimes not as good. Uh, But they tend to find the first round guys and take them and they end up hitting. Uh, so I just worry a little bit about some of the quarterback with the brain. You want the brain and the athleticism, right? And the arm talent, right? You need a little bit of everything there. Um, you know, we come back to, I would rather take a chance and miss on a Trey Lance than take a chance and miss on a Mac Jones personally. I mean, I'd rather swing for the fences there, especially in the AFC West uh, where Denver's at right now. You think, you know, bringing in an Andy Dalton, is going to move the needle in Denver. If anything, it's going to get you stuck. Uh, And then you're like, okay, well, we finally have competent quarterback play. Do we pay him? I mean, that's like, I'm, I'd be scared if I was the dolphins out there with like Tua and the injuries and stuff. It's like, Oh my God, is he going to get paid 40 million a year for Tua? I mean, I don't know if I'd be doing that. Um, But especially as day two, we can start to talk about this guy lacks this, this guy lacks that. But if you're using top half of the first round pick, you don't want to be, negatives in some of those categories. Uh, so, you know, you need both. They also, it's not just the brain. It's not just the athleticism. They need to be an absolute psychopath competitor. Um, yeah. that's, that's a requisite, uh, for me to use a premium pick on them. I mean, John, I'll never forget, you know, John Elway one had all the quarterbacks over for pool once a week. And once he lost a game of pool, he sold that pool table and got a new one had the stink of losing on it. That, that's kind of what you're looking for, uh, for a quarterback. Yeah. Maybe, you know, doesn't always work in relationships and other aspects of life, but it's that, it's that Kobe mentality, uh, where yeah. I it's, I need to win. Like I need air, uh, which is built different, literally. Um, yeah. but, uh, any final thoughts? I still talking wide receivers, uh, Cortland Sutton, 
if I had to ask you uh, a month from now, would Cortland Sutton be, is, is Cortland Sutton going to be on the Broncos? What do you think? I, I say yes. Just, I don't think his contract's all that crazy. Like you said, I, I think he's a nice veteran to have in the room. Tim Patrick, you can't really trust him to stay healthy. <clears throat> Marvin Mims, not going to be your number one by any means. That's just not his kind of game. Um, you know, they just, they, why you go down that list and none of them can do quite what Cortland Sutton can do overall. And for all these, you know, I know in our comments, we've seen a lot of people talking about different quarterbacks in this draft and stuff like that. If you want a young quarterback to come in, you don't get rid of Cortland Sutton. That, that's my big thing. Like if you really want to draft a quarterback, you keep Sutton around at least for a year, just again, just to help a guy with his development more than anything else. Um, I, I just, I, I watched what the Panthers just did. They go draft Bryce young, but part of the trade to get him is they trade his number one wide receiver, DJ Moore and DJ Moore goes and has a great season for the bears and Panthers are left with nothing. So, but, uh, what we are left with here is Michael Ronquillo coming in with lots and lots of stars for us. Michael, you are the man, the legend, the myth. All those things. Thank you so much. Saying great show tonight, Nick and Carl, and building the Broncos. Go Broncos. Go Michael. Um, I, I just I can't say enough how great it is every week coming on the show. Just seeing you show up, Michael, and uh, support all of our shows, but especially here on Tuesday. Just appreciate it. Thank you for showing up. And uh, I, I saw earlier you said I just can't wait for the draft to be over. Part of me is like that. Of I just want to see who the Broncos get. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of me also loves this build up to it. So. Uh, but I appreciate you being with us every step of the way there, Michael. You got to love the process. And as uh, Scott says here, Michael, we held the, you to the end for those big stars. Thanks for closing us out. Thanks, everyone, for coming in and joining us today. Not many more shows until the draft. And, I mean, that's what building the Broncos is all about, that team building stuff. And uh, we wouldn't be here without you guys. So shout out to everybody who came in with the stars, uh, helping us out today. Riptie, Troy Boer, Michael a couple times, of course, Cody W., Phil McLaughlin, talk about an OG. Gary Palmer as well. DTR, a lot of comments, and then coming in with the super chat as well. God bless you. Phil again. Riptie a few more times. You guys were great today. Thank you so much for supporting the show and supporting uh, Carl and I, of course, and all of Mile High Huddle. If you haven't done so yet, follow Carl and I on Twitter. Carl's at Carl Dummer, MHH. I'm at Nick Kendall, MHH. Also follow us at Mile High Huddle. If you haven't done so yet, join us at Facebook.com forward slash Mile High Huddle and Facebook.com forward slash Mile High Huddle Pod. And as that ticker says there underneath, please subscribe to our show over on YouTube. Like the show on your way out. Or if you're, you know, haven't done it already or you know, watching it from the beginning, drop the thumbs up and, uh, share on your social media platforms and Michael's the closer, but we got to extra innings here. Uh, another one coming in here. Uh, GGG 499 saying, do we a little more justified for Justin Simmons? Cause he's still not signed. I guess the, I almost wonder if it's part of the thing where Justin Simmons has been around and he's a veteran at this point that he's one of those players that is slow playing it a tad. Uh, because the money might not be what he wanted there, but also it probably wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for him to miss voluntary stuff in OTAs. I know there's a quarterback that's been linked to the Broncos that might be on this a similar path, a veteran there who's like, you know, he might be coming here, but not until a little further down. So he doesn't have to do some of the, uh, the veteran stuff. Uh, but um, yeah, I think that Denver may be a little bit justified moving on from him that uh, because he still has not been picked up. Yeah. It, it does sound like he has talked to quite a few teams. He has a few offers on the table and he is just, he, he can take his time at this point. Like there's mm -hmm. not going to be a ton of signings and teams running out of more money at this point. Like there, there might be a signing a day between the 32 teams, maybe two or three at, at tops. And they're all these low end contracts. So he doesn't have to rush his decision. Like I said, missing voluntary workouts, because this isn't even team drills. This isn't you running plays. This is you doing some workouts with your teammates. That's all this really is at this point. Um, he, he doesn't need that. He's always in great shape. He's always ready to go. So I I'm, I'm not too worried about him. Um, just unfortunately for him, it fell at a terrible time. All the safeties hit the free agent market all at the same time. Like all the top guys, it just seemed like the, the market got flooded and any other year he's probably signed within the th first three days of free agency or traded. Maybe Broncos could have traded him and got something for him. 
Um, but this year, it just that was such a weird thing. There's always that one position every year that it just seems like the market gets flooded because everybody's moving on from the big contracts. Yeah. Safety markets wild. Uh, thank you so much, GGG, for coming in last minute. Uh, always appreciate you. I see Pearl. I don't know if you said hi to Pearl as well, but always love to give Pearl a shout out. Uh, thanks, everyone. We got to go. I got to get on baby duty. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Uh, continue to choose kindness and compassion. Carl, it's always good to hang out and see you. And uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Oh, and a programming note. Scott and I are live tomorrow morning uh, for the Broncos for breakfast, Mondays and Wednesdays. So uh, there we go. Um, We'll see you guys tomorrow morning, but until then, choose kindness and compassion. Go Broncos.